We're going to uh, turn to our scripture reading now, and it's found in Ephesians 2, verse 8. Ephesians 2 and verse 8. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. And today we have Melissa Cook, um, who's going to give us our sermon. And just for those of you who may not know, Melissa is the executive secretary for our uh, church conference in Moncton. And we're so thankful that you're here today, Melissa, and your family. And we would see Jesus. Amen. Thank you. Amen. All right. Happy Sabbath, everybody. Thank you so much, Elaine, for that lovely introduction. I am happy to be here with you in Pugwash. Uh, it is beautiful here always, even in the winter run. It's beautiful. When you told me there was ice in the ocean, I was like, I want to see that. You know, so yeah, I'm excited to see it. We're going to walk down after, after, well after, you know, whenever that is. Um, this morning, we're going to go into Ephesians. Thank you for reading that scripture. And I, as I was praying about this, I thought, you know what? Let's, let's dig a little bit deeper and let me teach you something about the beauty about God's word. Um, let's see. Yes, I prepared a PowerPoint for you today. I hope that's okay. Um, because I find visuals sometimes help us to focus on that which we want to focus on. Um, our sermon title this morning is His Workmanship. And it is amazing how God works things out as uh, we were talking about creation during Sabbath school, right? And even in the children's story, we we're talking about Father God and listening to him. And, and God has brought all this together. So I'm just excited to share with you. I'm going to put up, there we go, the scripture out there, up here. Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. Um, but I, I think I'm going to hold off on reading it. But for your convenience, I put them up. Is that too small? Or is that OK? I guess it depends on our eyesight, right? <laughs> So here's our scripture, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand, so that we may walk in them. And these two verses are ones we're going to focus on today. Will you just bow your heads and have a quick prayer with me? Father God, I just pray, Father, that you would continue to be in this place, God. That your Holy Spirit may be here with us. That we may learn from you. That your words and your love may touch our hearts today. And that we may be changed and see Jesus. In his name I pray, amen. Amen. Ephesians was written in a time where, although Paul was imprisoned, he still exercised some of those liberties and took the opportunity to write letters to various churches. Many of you know this, but it's good to give a, a quick, brief outline. In this letter, Ephesians in particular, he wrote to a church situated in a popular pagan city, Ephesus. Oh, I have a picture for you. Here in Ephesus, there was a temple of Ar Artemis, Ar Artemis, thank you, my brain just stopped on that, or Diana, okay? And this was easily double the size of the other temples in that area. It was a very, very popular place. Among the customary practices of the temple priests were indulgence in spiritualism, immorality, and it really created a, a huge sense of false worship and very, I'm going to say it this way, unhealthy entertainment. Okay? So um, as it was a hot spot, the sailors, all the ships would come to the sailor and trade would happen. The sailors would unembark, take a day off, and enjoy what we're going to call pagan worship. This is the environment in which Paul writes to these group of Christians living in this very city. 
In the first chapter of Ephesians, Paul, we can read Paul praising God for his blessings in Christ. He prays that the believers have an understanding of the hope of his calling and the riches of his glory and their inheritance for them. He says, you are heirs. He stresses God's authority and power and dominion above all. Because remember, they're used to many gods, many temples, right? So he's, he's focusing them. All of this is to remind the reader of the authority and power and creatorship of God alone. No other God, no other power uh, would compare. And then we turn to chapter 2, which is where we're going to focus. And we read about our spiritual poverty. And I say our because it's humanities. You know, to the, to the readers, their spiritual poverty, in which we read in verses 1 through 3. And now I'm going to go back and read this. And so what I've done is I have highlighted a few things. Uh, so the highlights and the bulls are obviously my additions. But let read with me. And you were dead in your trespasses and sin, in which you formerly walked, according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. Among them, we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our flesh, indulging in the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. But God, and I, I love that, and I, that's in red for you, because sometimes in life, things happen, and we have to say, wait, but God, right? Let's not focus on whatever is happening. Maybe we fell. We have to say, but God, help me. Being rich in mercy, verse 4, because of his great love, which he loved us. And I'm going to, and that's underlined, because this is part of our focus today. Even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised up with him and seated with him in the heavenly places of Jesus Christ, so that in the ages to come he might show the surpassing riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. Amen. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result of works that no one may boast. And I'm sorry, the red is not uh, showing up really well there. But verse 10, for we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. This is a reason to celebrate, friends, isn't it? When we accept Jesus into our lives, into our hearts, he begins to mold us, to change us, to give us a new direction, a new purpose, a hope, and a mission. We must daily choose to be God's workmanship. We must daily choose this. We can do it yesterday, but it doesn't transfer to tomorrow. I mean, I feel like it kind of does, if that's your base of function, let me say. But it must be in us to still consciously, daily choose to be his workmanship. And as we turn our authority over to God of our lives, and we talked about it in Sabbath school, right? Who is, who is God? Who are we focusing on? It's not me. It's you, Lord. He begins a good work in us. One that scripture says has been, verse 10, prepared beforehand. God has a purpose for each of our lives. And that purpose may be different, right? Maybe God has made me to do something or be somewhere or go somewhere. I have a friend who's a missionary because God called her to be a missionary, right, to another country. Each of us, each of us are made with a purpose. And scripture and Paul shares continuously that Jesus came to seek and save the lost. He died so that we could live. He gave his life and sent the comforter to help us, to be with us, to partner with us as we continue this journey on this earth. The letter, the letter of Ephesians is packed, actually. It's amazing how much he packs in there, but it's packed with so many rich messages of God's love for us 
that today in this time together we aren't able to unpack all of that but I'm hoping to unpack a few verses and teach you a little bit of Greek which is one of um, the languages that the Bible was written in but it is not my strength okay of the two languages Hebrew is definitely my favorite and I uh, do it better but Greek is just so uh, beautiful too and in this case I wanted to share this with you I pray that it may comfort and edify you um, as we look at the scripture as we've seen in the gray in the very top verse uh, 1 and 2 we see our human condition we are dead in our trespasses how we formerly walked and what is God's uh, answer to that can anyone tell me it's in the scripture it's right there in the gray too and that's how I highlighted it so can anyone read for me the bottom of verse 5 thank you by grace you have been saved and Paul puts it here in verse 2 and then puts it again in verse 8 so he wants you to really know it by grace you have been saved God intervenes in our lives God intervenes in our situation God intervenes in the world stage and by grace we are saved and I want to highlight now a few things of this text we're going to go to verse 3 Let's see if I nope I'm going to go to verse 3 there we go okay among them we are to all formally so we too all formerly lived in the lusts of our mind, lusts of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and we were by nature children of wrath. Sometimes my children get on my nerves, okay? But I would never call them children of wrath. That seems a little bit extreme, right? I might call them my monkeys or something probably similar. Uh, but we wouldn't want to so this phrase you think what is what does this mean what does it mean children of wrath and what I thought we would do here is look at it in the Greek what does it say how is it structured that we can understand it a little bit better and so as I shared with you uh, the Greek is more complicated in my opinion than the Hebrew it, it is it has more words maybe that's a better way to put it and so in the Greek the, the, the way that uh, nouns are con verbs, verbs, sorry, are conjugated, nope, nouns, I was right, are five, five ways. So the nominative, the dative, the accusative, and the genitive. And in this case, in the Greek, in the words children of wrath, we find a genitive of purpose of destination. So at the bottom I wrote for you, for uh, those of you who want to read more about it, these are the five. But in this case, we're using a genitive, and the genitive expresses the relationship between a noun that can usually be translated as of or from. So this is of Melissa or from Melissa. That makes sense. Okay. So here, when it says children of wrath, um, the gender that is used according to mounts. I wonder if I have that. Yep. That's where that was. Nope, I didn't put it on the screen. Apologies. According to Mounts, it is instead of children of wrath, it might be translated a little bit better for our understanding, children destined for wrath. And you can understand that a little bit better, right? So if we determine we're going to say no to God, we're going to continue in our folly, let's say it, we're destined for wrath. And that, you know, I'm not going to call my children of wrath but if you continue in this way that might be your destination yes if we continue in sin that is the end result but when we turn to Jesus our former ways yeah our former ways are gone and we are raised up with him and are able to sit with him, the scripture says. Sit with him in heavenly places. Because by grace, we have been saved. 
through faith. So if you recall in verse 5 states, as we just mentioned, by grace you have been saved. And then Paul, again, as we noted before, emphasizes it again. Because this is super important. He wants to make us um, make sure we know definitively how we are saved. So how are we saved? By grace, through faith, right? So no matter what we do, how much tithe we give, how much we serve the needy, it doesn't matter what our good deeds are, how many uh, stairs we've climbed on our knees, it doesn't matter how much we've self-sacrificed or even suffered. Nothing that we do can earn salvation. It won't even come close to the value. Our works, our good behavior, even who we are, even being a good person, is not good enough. We must be saved by the grace of Jesus. In fact, the good behavior and our good works are a result. It is the effect of salvation. And we talked about kindness, right? In Sabbath school, kindness being a result of who we are and how God has changed us. Because, friends, we are his workmanship. You are his workmanship. Um, and I want to dig a little bit deeper. And I put some definitions here for you. Workmanship. So in the dictionary, a workmanship is something affected, made, or produced. The art or skill of a workman, also the quality imparted onto a thing in the process of making it. Um, the word in Greek is poema. It, you see it in Greek there, and then you see the, the uh, transliterations next to it. And that word in that conjugation means that which has been made. The root word is poeo, and I wrote it in the bottom here. To do, to make, to form, to construct. Each of us makes something, right? Whether in our jobs or in our hobbies. I know that some make quilts here that are very beautiful. Uh, I think about Richard, and he's always tinkering, right? Making something wrong, right? My boys love to build with Lego, physically and digitally. Will you bring me the Lego now? I asked him to share Lego with me so I could show you. Thanks, buddy. OK. This is called Little Guy. It's a person. Oh, Little Girl. Sorry, this was a female one. OK. And he told me yesterday that what's really cool about it is the little person can jump, and this machine contraption will hover and always catch her. Isn't that cool? Yeah. So what is my purpose of showing you this? That this is my son's workmanship. In his five-year-old mind, or my nine-year-old, I'm not actually sure which one built it. Maybe they built it together. That would be great if they did. The intent, the creatorship, this is his art of how he's making it. This has a purpose. This has a purpose. And this is. Um, his intent, and then there is a result. So when this little guy falls, this one will catch it and then fly away. You know, I'm not sure what else it does, but we are more beautiful than this guy here, right? We are God's workmanship. We are his art, friends. And it, that doesn't mean that like we're perfect, because we know we're not. But in Jesus, in Jesus we can be. Because it is by, by grace we have been saved. Now, each of you, I think, have something you like to create, right? I know that some of you are probably famous for some dessert or some lasagna that I'm actually hoping to taste here while at Potluck. Um, but each of us will pour our skills, our art into it and create something beautiful. And sometimes, sometimes that I'm going to see if I can skip to this. It takes a little while to make something, right? So I, uh, my last name is Cook, with an E at the end. And when I got married, people were like, you must be a good cook. I am not. I am not. I 
have maybe learned a little bit over the years of being married and having a family. But sometimes it takes time for that to happen, right? So when I first started making this banana bread, I would mash with the bananas, put in the flour and the sugar, and the, whatever the recipe said, because I wasn't going to deviate from that. And I would bake it, and it would just be too sweet. You know, and I was like, and there's no crunch. And there's no chocolate. And what's banana bread without chocolate? I know that some of you may disagree, but that's just my opinion, right? And, and over time, I would say, OK, well, let me, let me half the sugar, because that's healthier. You know, let me use applesauce instead. Let me not use eggs. Let me use something else. Let me add some walnuts. Let me add some cocoa powder. Well, at that time, it was really, really chocolatey. I didn't do that again. That was too much. But anyway, we could add some walnuts in there. But that process took time. And each of us take time. But we will take different time. But only God knows, by his grace, how much time each of you take, need to bake, using this illustration. right? And I praise God, as we were talking in Sabbath school and I was thinking, I praise God that Melissa is not in charge of determining when Mr. Jason is ready. right? God is the one. Praise God. But God, that's what I'm going to say. God is the one that determines when my salvation has been actualized. And so praise God that we can have a church family here that can be gentle with each other as we move through that and be molded under God's grace. Your faith has saved you. His work in your life is what will save you. He has a purpose for you. And I want and I dare say that God is proud of you. When I was little, I wanted to hear that a lot. I was like, I just want to make someone proud. And now I just want to make God proud. <laughs> Everyone else, that's OK. Right? But God is proud of you. When you believe in him, when you say, yes, Jesus, every day, mold me, change me, clean me, because I know I'm not perfect, and I fall every day and scrape my knee, but I want to get up in the name of Jesus. He is proud of you. In the Greek, oh, let's go this way. In the Greek, there is a word named hina, and that's what I wanted to share with you today as well. There we go, the hina clause. Um, the Greek is there, and I translated it here. So the hina clause. So not only is hina used for the result in the New Testament, but it's also a purpose result, OK? That is, it indicates the intention and its sure accomplishment. In other words, the New Testament writers employ the language to reflect their theology. What God purposes is what happens. And consequently, hina is used to express both divine purpose and result. So we're going to wrap our minds around hina. It means here's the divine purpose, and here's the result. Hina is used three times in this section. We're going to talk about two. And you can find the other one this afternoon, should you wish. Okay? So. Verse, uh, this is our scripture. For by, Hina is in black. So let me just put that, write that out. So, for by grace, is divine purpose, you have been saved through faith. And not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not as a result, Hina, okay, so that no one may boast. Do you see the divine purpose and the result? I want you to think about this in your life, in your life. Is this true in your life? This is the divine purpose. By grace, you have been saved. Not of you. It's God's gift. And not of your works. So that no one may boast. Do you boast? And that's a rhetorical question. You don't have to answer. Right? But this is how it was structured in the Greek. This is the divine purpose. God wants everyone to know that by grace you have been saved. And Paul emphasizes it twice, right? So that no one can say, well, I'm better than you. Or because I'm a pastor, I'm on some sort of holier level than you know. No. In fact, God has me more accountable. Right? God's divine purpose is that everyone, and, and it, even the boasting is not the point. The point is, 
let us point you to the real reason of salvation. The purpose is Jesus. That's where we want you to look. The next, is, the next hina phrase is in verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Jesus Christ for good works, which God prepared beforehand. Hina, or so that we would walk in them. God's divine purpose is that we would know that he created us, gave us purpose, wants us to walk in the way of Jesus, which was a good work. If you remember and what you've read and what I'm sure you, you, you know in your, in your heart who Jesus is. This is what he wants. So that we would, the purpose is, we would walk in them. Not to boast again about our works, but to focus on our Savior, Lord Jesus. Do you see the divine intention, the purpose and the result? You can see the hina, it's, it's cool. I kind of, I think about it as like a scale. It shouldn't be a scale though, I guess it should be a, a, like a triangle. Anyway, it doesn't matter. There, yeah, like I said, there's one more hina clause in uh, these verses and you know, you probably will pick it up really quick. Um, but hina will be translated as so that. Okay, so you can look at it and really think, this is God's purpose and this is his desired result. I was going to tell you now about banana bread, but I already did, so I don't have to tell you again. Um, and I hoped to bring banana bread, but it didn't work out. <laughs> and I didn't bring it. <laughs> but my husband makes a better banana bread anyway, so um, next time I come, we'll, we'll uh, implore Jason to, to make one. God shapes each of us. He molds each of us. He loves each of us, right? He gave us our Savior Jesus so that we would not have to bend on our knees or hit ourselves or suffer some kind of payment to try to, but to work, to, to earn salvation. But belief in Jesus is what our scripture and our Lord wants. And my prayer is that each of us will allow him to be his workmanship every day, to construct us, you know, to mold us. Sometimes that means taking off a piece. Sometimes that hurts. But praise God, he will be with us through it. We are saved by faith in Jesus. And I want to pray for each of you, for me too, that we may live our lives showing the effects of our salvation and God's goodness in our lives. Holding on to our Savior Jesus who enables us to be saved by faith in him. Amen. Let us pray. Father God, I just want to praise you, God, because you are creator but you are also sustainer, Father. You are the one that heals us, that molds us, that strives with us, Father. We want to praise you that you are a personal God and knows each of us so intimately, God. We praise you that you do not tarry, but that you want all to be saved, Father. And that we have that hope that one day we can be with you in a place that will have no suffering, no tears, no illnesses. We praise you, Father, for giving us hope and salvation through our Savior, Jesus Christ. And we want to praise you for his grace, for your word that teaches us about you. We love you, Father, and we thank you, and we ask that you bless each person here, Father, each family that is represented here, Father, that your spirit may go with them and bless them abundantly. We ask these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Mm -hmm.